really the essence of Ephesians is found in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. This is what Paul says to you and to me. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, that's you and me, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. All of us are missionaries. All of us have a calling to know and to serve God. And we have special guests with us this morning. Myrna and uh, Diana, Diana Garrett and Myrna Sotomayor have been our missionaries for many, many years. I met uh, Myrna in 1992. So how many years ago was that? 26? Man, I'm feeling young. 26 years ago, uh, we served on our first um, short-term mission trip in Costa Rica. Myrna was serving in Costa Rica at that time. They are now serving together at Camp Kikamar in Mexico. Exciting, exciting ministry. And I would like them to come up and uh, sit with me, and we're going to have a discussion this morning. So please give a warm Memorial Park or welcome to our two missionaries, Myrna and Diana. Good to have you both here. I hope you're enjoying your stay, getting a little rest and relaxation. And I know this is your favorite thing to sit in front of all these people <laughs> this morning. But I would like you to just share um, a little bit about your calling uh, to the Lord. Well, um, I received Jesus Christ when I was 24 years old. But my calling for missions uh, happened to be when I was seven years old. My family wasn't a Christian, but we loved to read. And uh, more than the books that we had, it was a biography of uh, David Livingstone, the missionary to Africa. So I was probably seven years old, maybe eight. And I, in my heart, get uh, impressed with those words. And I want to be a missionary, so when I became a Christian, um, I always was involved with missions, and someday a friend told me, uh, do you want to meet a real missionary? And I said, yes, where is she? And she said, well, um, uh, let's see, and I will present her. So I was expecting somebody like my age, I am 61, um, and wearing in black suits and something like that. So I met Lisa Anderson Umana, which is from this church. She was 22 years old, and, uh, and she was wearing shorts. Woo! <laughs> so we started being good friends, and she introduced me to, to the missions in, in Memorial Park. And Memorial Park, for me, is my home church. I am visiting here for the last 35, 36 years, and, and I always feel uh, at home in this place. Thank you for your love, for your support, for your encouragement. God bless you guys. Well, I met Jesus when I was 11 years old at a Christian camp in San Jose, Costa Rica. I grew up in Costa Rica, and from that moment that I was 11 years old, I felt a calling to God towards missions. And I told the Lord I would go anywhere that he sent me, but I said, I, I really don't want to go to Mexico. Because <laughs> Mexico had been, it was a country I had been born in. My mother is Mexican. and. I just thought that that wasn't the place I wanted to go. But God worked with my heart very gently and brought me to Mexico and gave me a love for Mexico that it's now been 25 years I've been serving in Mexico and that love has never failed. And for the first 13 years, uh, I worked with Mirna in, on the edge of Mexico City in a slum area. We started a community center and we worked with children and their mothers, leading them to Jesus. And we thought we would be there for the rest of our lives in this community center. How did God call you uh, both to Camp Kikamar? 
Well, our, um, the director of our mission, his name was Juan Isais, and he, in the last months of his life, he was dying of cancer. He made a phone call to me to talk about a situation we were dealing with in our ministry. And he talked to us about that, he talked to me, and then uh, we had already said goodbye, and all of a sudden he stopped me and said, wait a minute, I have one more thing. And he said, please remember, both of you never forget Camp Kikomar. And then he hung up. He didn't even say goodbye. And so those literally were his very last words to, to me and to Mirna through me. And so five years later, when we were called by God to give this ministry into the hands of a local pastor or community center, those words came up as a second calling to say, I want you to go down to the Gulf Coast, to this property that has nothing on it, and start getting, you know, working to build up the camp. It was something that Juan wasn't able to do, and he had passed on that calling to us. So 12 years ago, we moved down to Camp Kikomar with just a tent to live in and a campfire to, uh, to eat. And we were eating literally what was fished out of the sea most of the time. We would eat uh, crabs and cooked fish and just had, it was a wonderful adventure to begin with. And in those first years, we were not uh, able to, we didn't have much money or anything to, to work with, so we spent much time in prayer and asked God for a vision for Kikomar. And the vision that God gave us was that Kikomar was to be a place of reconciliation, of reconciliation with God and with, with each other. So we saw the table as a symbol of reconciliation. God reconciles us to himself through the table, through, through the bread and the wine, and that is what he instituted. And he also calls us to bring people into reconciliation with each other by sitting at the table and uh, being at peace. And so this picture was taken uh, in the site that we were going to build the dining hall in January 1st of 2014. And it took three years to build that dining hall. And Memorial Park Church was a key player in getting the dining hall built, uh, giving us offerings and praying for us. And we have a number of cabins as well. And during the last three years, God has allowed us to be a full-time camp, receiving groups, and it is a place of peace and reconciliation. Many people tell us that when they come into the campgrounds, they, they have a sense of peace and an encounter with God and with each other. And we see how he is fulfilling the calling that he set for the camp. And one of the uh, exciting moments in our time in, in um, Camp Kikumar is when a group in 2013 coming from uh, Memorial Park Church arrived. It was just magnificent moments. And something that really amazed me always being here or with you guys in, in Mexico is you know how to do everything. So you wrote all the crafts and things to help the children and put in place the games, so it was fantastic. And two years ago, uh, and the two groups were lead for uh, Don, Don Crisi, and, the, and two years ago uh, also you went back um, and we have a, a marvelous time we went to the mountains with, uh, uh, to visit the brothers and sisters in the 
in the mountains, indigenous uh, church, and it was fantastic. And in the past month, we have uh, a group of 50, uh, 50 kids. They were coming also from the mountains, uh, kids that they don't have any possibility to be, uh, to be able to come to a camp or neither, neither to the ocean. But they, uh, they came in, and we have uh, a splendid time. And people there was, that is in the, at the mountains, the Christians are asking, when are you coming back? How many, of, how many of you saw the movie uh, with Tom Hanks, Castaway? Remember that? That's, this is kind of a Christian castaway that turns, <laughs> turned into a great, great story. Tell us more stories about what's happening at Camp Kickamore. Well, uh, I'd like to tell you a story about our home. Uh, we often call our home the accordion home because sometimes it's just the two of us and then it gets stretched out and then stretched out again to welcome people who come for different reasons. And the mo our most recent arrivals are pictured there for they're completely separate and both of them happen to have injuries on the same ankle or the same foot. And both of them visited a doctor that we trust and who diagnosed and put them in a cast. And so uh, the, the man is Pastor Macedonio, and he is a pastor of an indigenous church that was visited by the group of Memorial Park two years ago, and we had a wonderful time with him. He is a, he is a very godly pastor, and about two months ago, he hurt his ankle up in the cornfield, and he just continued walk using it because there was so much work to do. And because he used an injured ankle without uh, care, it was getting worse. So he came to, to our camp at a, about three, four weeks ago, and we saw him and we said, you've got to have that ankle seen too. And we took him to the doctor, and he said, oh, it's not a serious injury. He just needs to get off it for two weeks. And the only way that that's going to happen is if I put it in a cast and not allow him back to his village. So everybody in the congregation got together, and they all went and worked in his cornfield and got it you know, weeded, and everybody did the work, and his wife and his daughter came to take care of him, and he spent the first vacation of his life sitting and looking at the ocean with his foot up in the air. He had never had a rest before. And this was the very last day he was getting his cast off, and another friend also from the mountains who had had a, an injury in her ankle came, and the doctor said, this is much more serious and she is going to need rehabilitation for about three months. And the only place that the rehabilitation is available is in Tuxpan, where we are. So we now have this family staying with us for three months while she goes through rehabilitation so that her ankle can be restored. And so God has opened up the accordion house once again. And, um Eli and mother uh, and their children are the care caretakers of our camp. And when they arrived five years ago, uh, Eli wasn't a Christian, and the oldest boy was very sick. He was one year old and uh, very, very sick. They, they, and didn't have, they don't know what to do with the, the boy. And after two days being at the, the beach, uh, the boy started uh, improving, and probably one week later, he was completely healed. And two or three weeks later, um, we had um, a camp, just men, and, um, and, I told, and, and we told uh, the pastor, Eli is not a Christian. So all the, the guys were probably more than 20 guys, surrendered him and uh, all the time we're talking about Jesus Christ to him. 
But he said that the, something that really impressed him was that they were playing and nobody said any horrible word. They never, uh, you know, sometimes guys are very tough and uh, hit each other and they never do. Did. And the other thing that happens is he saw them singing, praying, crying, and probably he was absolutely impressed that he, uh, they were cooking, which I'm a Mexican man. So uh, he, uh, at the end of that uh, retreat, he became a Christian and he's a very committed Christian and, and all the family is walking, following Jesus. Praise God, and so much of that just happens through hospitality, opening up their home and opening up the camp, and uh, my ankle is hurting now. <laughs> Two weeks, maybe. T tell us, tell us some, um, some challenges you face there at Camp Kikamar. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges in ministry, and I think in the world in general, is to that we are called to break down walls of hostility. Kevin read about living a life worthy of the calling we have received. And there is so much hostility in our world, you know, even within the people of God and from one social group to another and between men and women and so many different ways in which hostility is there. And we are called to bring the peace of Christ into that and break down all wall of hostility. And what you can see there is a group mostly of women from a, from a remote indigenous community. And this community is discriminated and isolated because first, because they are indigenous and they are looked down upon. It's kind of like in India, the untouchables. They are looked down upon because they are indigenous. They are Nahuatl speaking Aztecs. And then they are also further discriminated within their own community because they are evangelicals. And everybody else in the community is uh, identified as a Catholic, but that Catholicism is mixed with traditional beliefs and a lot of paganism. And so there is not a honoring of the one true God. There's much more of an animistic belief with, with some Catholicism mixed in. And so whenever anybody becomes a Christian and meets the true God, they get ostracized and sometimes expelled. And just this last week, we heard in this, in many of these very people that are on the screen, their children are not being allowed in the school. And the only reason given is that their parents are Christians. And so therefore they have lost the right to be in school. And we are praying through this situation that God will bring down that wall and bring peace in that community once again. And we are called also to help women because even within the Christian community, women just have no place. And there's a particular family that four of their children are severely uh, impaired both of their hands and their feet and in the last couple of years we were able to get two sewing machines for the two daughters who are impaired and I don't know how they do it but they do this beautiful embroidery in spite of the fact that their hands don't work right and so they have set up a sewing workshop and they're selling their embroidered blouses and we have seen how, how their dignity is, is restored. And with their brothers, we have also been able to help them to find ways of making a living in spite of their disability. And uh, <clears throat> Esmeralda is a, a young uh, woman that uh, she finished high school and after high school, you don't have anything. 
you don't, you don't have any opportunity for start studying further. Uh, but we, uh, she wants to be a, a nurse. So we talked to um, uh, the Dr. Luis Hurtado. She is, all, uh, excuse me, he's also a missionary from Memorial Park. And he serves in a, a indigenous community in the mountains too, in the Wicha, with a child. So we call, we tell him, uh, uh, we told him about uh, Esmeralda, and he invited her for some months to receive a course of, uh, of uh, nursing. Uh, so now she knows how to uh, put um, shots, to give medicine, uh, to take the blood pressure. And she's back to her community, and she feels very happy because the heavens are opening. If you could uh, challenge us as Christians, missionaries in our own right here at Memorial Park Church in the North Hills of Pittsburgh, what word would God have for us through you today uh, to us? Say yes to the Lord. The Lord is calling us. The first calling that he is giving us over and over day after day is come to me. I love you. And if you need to repent, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, just come. Confess your sins and receive his forgiveness. He has his arms open. And I know sometimes it's difficult to say yes. I know from my own experience sometimes. We want the accordion to be just a little bit close and have our own music. But the truth is, when we say yes to the Lord, in his, to his calling, to open our hearts and our lives to him, the music can be just fantastic. Don't be afraid to say yes. Just come and say yes. And you don't need to come to Mexico. Just come to your family. Maybe you have problems with somebody in your family. Just open your arms and say, forgive me, please. And um, as one of the ways that I like to, to think is through images. And, and I think of the image of a top, like spinning the top like used to happen when we were little kids. And when we look at this top, we see that we are like that little point at the bottom of the top. And we are just a little bit of nothing. We, we it, so it seems. And God has given us a great and wonderful calling. He has called us, and what allows this top to spin is the incredible weight that is above the top, and that is our God. And we are like that little point, and our job is to be in line with Jesus, to have our focus on Jesus, to understand that it's not in our strength, and to be focused sharply, like that little point. It must be in one place. It mustn't be all over the place, because then it loses its balance, and it can't spin anymore. And so God, the verse that Kevin read at the beginning was, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. And so that is my challenge to you and to myself, that we may continue to see that our strength is in being in line with God, to being focused and know exactly what he's calling us to do, and to let him lead us and guide us.